Greetings and welcome to another installment of learning about Ganonga, language from the Solomon Islands. Uh, I'm Peter. I'm Tyler. All right, let's get started. Let's so, get continued, rather. Well, Tyler has created a few new spreadsheets here, and it might be helpful to look at these if you, particularly if you are looking to do this on your own. This is the kind of thing that will be helpful to you. So I'll navigate, but Tyler will explain right. what's going on. Yeah, let's just look at the annotation tab. I created this the other day because I've been thinking, how can we keep track of, well, the word order is a bit challenging. How can we keep track of what the basic word order is in the clause as well as the tense and maybe other details too in a simple way? So what I did was I just copied our collection of text so far, we've got three input, keeping all of the reference material in those first four columns there, and then got on good English. But I added a column outside that for tense and other notes, my annotation. So let's look there at line four, where we have a simple clause. What I want to do here is not destroy any information, but just duplicate. So rows three and four have the same stuff in them, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Now you've moved it. Those are repeated, but in the lower line, I'm just bracketing what I think, what I feel pretty confident are phrases. If we've got one clear noun phrase there, and then in the English, I'll give a word for word gloss, similar to what we do in Flex. And then in that outer column there, G, PA stands for past. That's not the, necessarily that the, the Verb is marked for past, but the setting of this event that we're being told is in the past. VB means a verb, so this is a verb initial clause. X stands for subject. X, Y, and Z are what I like to use for subject and then the two objects, respectively. Uh, so two lines below that, I use XX instead, and that's because it's a plural subject. Mm. Almost all that we have is in the Past. A few are in the present and a few are nominal clauses. I don't think we've seen much that's really future. Well, we've seen stuff talking about intention and so on. But mostly it seems to be verb initial, but, uh, but not always. So the rule seems to be in Kanonga, put the verb first, except when you don't. But as we continue working, I hope that this kind of format will be useful to shed light. If the format is not useful, I can just modify it as needed, add more columns, add more rows. So flex is really useful. We've seen that a lot, but also plain old spreadsheets are extremely useful Yeah. when you're studying language. Uh, and to note here, Tyler's system of bracketing here is something he devised himself. This is not standard linguistics, yep. um, though I think that it would probably help more people get into syntax if they started off with a style of bracketing like this. Um, it certainly helps with language learners when we're teaching a bit of language and they must know about syntax. This makes it a lot easier. Typically, when you want to get started in studying syntax, you're given a textbook that's hundreds of pages thick and has a bunch of uh, formalisms in it, and it's feels very inaccessible. But the reality is syntax is not that hard to understand. Um, there's just a gap between the people who understand it and the people who can explain it, I would say. And so to uh, introduce a bit about this bracketing system, uh, and again, when if you get to the really fine issues in formal syntax, you're going to need to use regular formalisms. Yeah, um, but for the kind of study we're doing here, this is much, much more useful, and you can immediately look at it and see what's going on. So what happens is, and please uh, jump in and tell me where, if I've misunderstood anything. You know I will. When you get these angled brackets, as in here on Beto, this is indicating that it's a, a verb. So verb. it's telling you about verb class, just or word class just to begin with. And you see we have colindia tu gu, the whole thing, which seems to be part of the verb complex or whatever, is also inside angled brackets. Then you get a noun phrase, 
and that's uh -huh. inside the square brackets. And there's lots of stuff inside it. So you could do nesting if you needed to. If you need to decide which is which dominate what or whatever, you could. But just looking at it, you can immediately start to see, oh, it's verb subject. It's extremely useful for this kind of thing. Let me I can show you another type of phrase. If you go down to the spreadsheet line 161. And that's yeah, I was looking for a prepositional phrase there. That's right. And I don't know if that's what's going to be in 161, but that was the next yeah, look for. It's gonna, but it's going to be nested also. There we go. Yeah. So hit it. Uh, don't, yeah, there you go. Don't hit tab. There, it's a nominal clause. So in column G, I put NOML, just a shorthand, nominal. Tangi Tangi was a warrior from Nonotongere. Non That's that clause that I'm looking at. Yeah. In line below. But just came up with a new one, double slashes, when it's that sort of ad nom, or what do you call it? Apposition, something like that. But Navarene Pa. No, no, don't get it. The place where he's from there, that's going to be a prepositional clause. Pa, a preposition. So I'm using the curly braces for that type of thing. And that is nested inside the noun phrase. Yeah, and if we wanted to continue explaining our nesting for some reason, if we wanted to or continue uh, expanding on that, we would put no, no, don't get it inside a square brackets, inside the curly brackets, inside the square brackets. But this is what is useful. It's useful to see that the prepositional phrase, which contains a noun, they pretty much always do. It's hard for them not to. Indeed. Um, is inside of what is nominally a noun phrase. So when you just look at the structure, it starts looking a lot like a relative clause. Right? One could say so, yeah. Tangi Tangi, um, who was a warrior from, it just doesn't have that kind of thing. When we do a lot of relative clauses without relative clause markers in our conversation in English, too. So this is probably something that happens in most languages to some extent. Uh, and it's not to say this is necessarily a relative clause. It could be something else, like some sort of focus or topicalization operation. But in any case, we would have a similar, I like the double slashes, this is new. You have something there to indicate that there's basically the relationship between the two things and you don't have to go as far as fully diagnosing what right, is right. this in theoretical syntax terms. You just say what it is on the surface. And that's what, what we it? actually want to know. And so I'm guessing N-O-M-L is nominalization. Just a nominal clause. It's nominal. verbless. I mean, it could be, if it's like Hawaiian, then maybe tangi tangi, a fret, maybe that's the predicate. And then the subject follows the slashes. Don't know. That I mean, perhaps, perhaps it could be that way. Good. Like be tangi tangi, a warrior from, you know. Yeah, yeah. Let's look at the two lines above where it's, I will tell their story. Uh, it seems I love. There we go. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, so two lines below that, I, I give my annotation. This one's in the future. I'm going to tell their story. And we, it's, so it's future in column G. And then the subject X is indicated twice. Once by mana. And then after the verb by ada, I think that's also I. I'm going to tell their story, I will. This is extremely interesting. In my opinion, uh, what's going on here is Ada is the free pronoun and the real, or the, depending on your point of view, my uh, dear mentor, Al Sheets, RIP, would say this is a subject initial clause, which is how he claims it works in Fijian, because Fijian has a bunch of these pre-verbal subject uh, agreement markers. However, other linguists, uh, I believe the main guy is Aronovic, uh, would claim that Fijian is verb initial, and those are all agreement things and thus part of the verb. So in our marking, right. I hate to say it, um, I actually agree with Aronovic on this one. So I would have put this mana inside yep. angled brackets myself, and I would say that the only real square bracket is the ada. One of our reasons for thinking this kind of thing is that um, when we get something like mana, you don't normally get it. You only get it in irrealis, right? Which is future is like irrealis. It's things that may have not yet be. come to pass. Yes. Yeah. Things that have not yet come to pass yet. So future and irrealis exist in the same universe, let's say in the same time frame relative to the present moment of speaking. Um, if you always, now, if you got free pronouns before the subject regularly, 
that would be different. That would feel um that would feel like all right, well, there's some kind of thing going on. When we look when we look through though, we do sometimes get, I think this one might even be a good example. Oh, you just haven't bracketed it all yet. But yeah, here you get but <laughs> Tongi Tongi had two names. Mm -hmm. Right. But there's two I mean, names. this might be a predicate situation where Tangi Tangi, two names. I think that we have seen examples of real noun phrases going before the verb. But I don't think that we have a subject, verb, object, default word order. I think what's going on is those are fronting operations and things can be fronted for pragmatic reasons All like right. focus and topic. And it'll be very hard for us to know what those reasons are from a text without um, speaking to real speakers and eliciting data and figuring out some things. And importantly, one of the things we can't do um, is, which is a crucial technique for descriptive linguistics is Tyler and I need to make up a bunch of sentences and see if they're grammatical. Yeah, yeah. So what, and importantly, we need to make some bad sentences that we think will be ungrammatical and then find out that they are, in fact, ungrammatical. And that's something you kind of can't do um, using just a text, which is one of the reasons that in the case of the little described languages that are vulnerable to language attrition over time, there's really a lot of impotence. There's a lot of urgency right now for linguists to study those languages if they want to know what's ungrammatical, which we do want to know. Uh, can you do a, a control F for the the string neg there's three negative clauses that i've annotated so far what you were just saying about the subject marking being part of the verb phrase would actually clear that up a lot so yeah. gani subject gani ke, it's also written together gani ke, onganai paro. so it seemed weird to just spell it together if there's that phrase boundary there although english does something similar too when we contract to be but now if I'm going to put they with the neg inside the verb phrase. That would do a couple things. It would explain why it's written that way, why that's seen, why it's treated like phonologically one word, and it would give us consistent verb initial clause order. That's right. So uh, I once I've collected a lot of data, my, what I'm going to do is alphabetize the sheet by column G, and then it, I'll get like with like, and unlike will be everything will be nicely sorted by my tagging. So I think that we're probably getting a distinction between realis and irrealis is when we're getting the two markings. For some subjects. This one is not, plus it's past, but we still have a subject index, Ngadi. Uh, for past, right? Looks like. Now, I've, there I've added a sign. I say PA0. And that's where we don't have a two or any kind of overt marking that it's passed. The context is that it's a completed action, but the verb says nothing about that, that we can, that, that I can tell you. Well, um, a zero mark past is on. I think that. there's a lot of zero mark pasts in our stories and that we're not getting real past or future marking ever. You don't think that the two is a real past marker? I think it's a perfect marker, but mm -hmm. it's as close as we're probably gonna get to a past marker. A lot of past seems to be understood through context. So it's written in unmarked tense, present. You might think present tense. That's just what I think. And I'm pretty open-minded as to what's going on. Um, one interesting possibility is that either the realis or irrealis isn't really marking number, just person. And that's something we need to flesh out a little bit more. This one, gadi. So we get in gay when it's by itself, right? Ooh. And that has been for third person plural normally, right? They. Yep. Here we get in Gadi. Um, I wonder if no, we've been getting K before on Nake, for example. Nake or is Nake. That. Um, I wonder if Adi really phonologically goes with the K and it's gay adi K, mm -hmm. but then the A deletes the sound, the letter E. And so Adi attaches to that for phonological reasons. But really that this whole thing, we could view it as three morphemes. 
And there's a certain spell out due to phonology, but it's not due to necessarily syntactic status. Um, but this isn't a story we haven't gone over yet in Flex, That's and true. I've never seen this story. That's right. I have been looking a bit at this third story. I couldn't wait. So with that, on that note, let's go back over to the text collection in Flex and do some more work there. So this is just to show you what you can do with really, this uses nothing fancy. So, you know, spreadsheets are available pretty freely, I think. I'm using the Google version, which is free if you have a Google account. And I've done over the years, used Flex for all kinds of things. It's easy to make dictionaries, lists of words, but also lists of phrases. And then if you annotate it like I've shown, then you can alphabetize and sort things really, really quickly in order to get insights. And then Flex, also free, but it takes it takes up a good chunk of your, <laughs> your hard drive, I guess. Not as free. I don't think Flex takes up that much memory. I thought it did quite a bit before, but with the way memory is cheap now. That's true. It's getting better. Yeah, I think it's it's much more reasonable now anyways than it was then. So we are in paragraph 13. After they went, and then they went ashore. Yeah, looks good. Now yeah. that goes much longer. We're going to have two or two at least ones together until we get to Biuru Veigamu. There you go. We finally get Gamu. I guess we've had Gamu before. We've had. So it's when they had reached the shore at Rinjon Bangara. The reason for all that catching is an omen, said all the old men. So the choiceful people are coming and will kill us all. So I'm not happy that they're fearing their deaths, but I'm happy that we're going to get some first person situations here in these sentences. They're coming to kill us. Okay, so look how much Flex already recognizes. To shore, which we like that for Fado. They went to shore. Would there be a no, big verb subject setting big in that? Parinjo Bagara. Those from oh. oh no, it's not that. They went to shore. We saw that in another text. Those from Maluku was always written like that. But here it's, they went to shore, ending at Ria. And the blockative, the preposition at Bangara is where they went to shore. So that's a new phrase here. Right. Um, at Rinjo Bangara. Now, Vivena is reason. Mm -hmm. Among others. Tell us that. It's be probably because the, we're not separate. Yeah. That's right. There's, we'd also get vei that's not reduplicated, which is what I think this is. I think this is a little bit shortened from vei vei, which is, if that's true, tells us something really interesting about the phonology. Usually in the reduplication, nothing is lost, but here we might see a segment lost. I'm going to check because I thought we already experienced this word before. The vei. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought we we, the, we have vei how v e i. We saw one that meant origin before. Remember? I do recall this. And I'm trying to organize it by gloss, so I'm looking for origin. Early on in the second text, the Maluku Let's text. Must not have really entered it. Yeah, yeah. We get vevena. Not infrequent. In each, I think each story has instances of Vivena. Ten hits total so far in story one, story two, and now story three. I think it is possessed like that. We what we can do is create a new one for Vive reason. I wouldn't call it an allomorph, but then in the lexicon we can tie this Vive to the simple Ve, and then all is connected. Reason in this instance, yeah, the how of it. The how, okay, you like that? Effect. Good, yeah. All right, no, I'm not going to call this anything. Call it create it's how reason, and I'm going to go to Veve. It'll let me, there we go, and I'm going to put. Reason, origin, reduplication of ve uh, 
file. Okay, we'll go back to our text in words, back to gloss. This, this is the Maluku text. Why is it not completely input? I guess we haven't finished. This hadn't we started inputting the third? We had not. We had not. Uh, we had uh, we're not even done with Maluku yet. You got way ahead. Fantastic. Okay. We don't have it in the third text. We don't know That's... how the story ends yet. Here we have Betawa. Pretty cool. Ah, it is a third singular agreement. Fabulous. Finish it, I guess. Let's see. The reason for all that catching is an omen. <laughs> Not too intuitive. Yeah, but it probably makes sense if you were a serial verb language. Now, what is serial verb? We've talked about this a little bit before, but it basically means when you can put multiple verbs in a in a linear order. <laughs> and only set of morphology with it instead of multiple repeated. Well, so here, check this out. You have nge, which we know is some sort of aspectual marker and means third plural. Then we get rave, which means cast fishing rod. And then we get beto, which means finish. And then the object agreement is really there at the end. So the object agreement, so one of the reasons the object agreement is probably best analyzed as a clitic and not a suffix is it attaches to the vinyl verb in the verb complex. I agree. Uh, rather than probably it's really talking about Rave casting the fishing rod because they said the reason for all that catching is an, an, an omen. For reason all that catching it, well, Rave and Beto must go together for Rave is casting, and when you Rave Beto, that's casting and actually catching something, right? Cast, finish. So we do things like this in English and it with phrasal verbs. So probably if you've studied some grammar in school, they've taught you something about the idea of like, oh, you can't, you know, something about the idea of verbs and prepositions. But the reality is there's a difference between a verb and a preposition and a verb and something that's homophonous with a preposition, but is part of the verb. So for example, run and up is a potential combination. And you would get something like two sentences. I run up the hill and I run up the bill. Those are different. They sound the same, but they are different. So to test it, we would use movement and you could say, up the hill is where I ran, that's fine. But up the bill is where I ran is not okay because run up is, it's a constituent, it's a chunk. Now you might be able to move something, I run the bill up. You can move something inside it, but you can't just take up with a something else and move it somewhere else. So if you think about this, um, when you, like you can run up a bill, you can run down your body, you can run various uh, particles. Run, and run out the clock. What's that? To run out the clock. Run out. Yeah, run out the clock. You can run out of flour. You, you can, depending on how you combine it with a particle, it dramatically can change the meaning. And all these meanings are memorized or known by speakers of English. And that's kind of the best analogy for how the phrasal verbs work. You put all these phrasal verbs together and the speakers know what it is. It may not be obvious to you. And sometimes it might be quite idiomatic. And you might think it's an error in transcription or something, but it's just the way yeah. verbs are um, kind of conceptually put together in the world of the speakers. Uh, let me give another case of a parallel English, parallel from English about serial verbs. I overheard a friend of mine say, would you mind go getting that? Where I think in standard English, you'd need to say going and getting. Go getting that going. Oh, go getting that. Interesting one. Like they're fusing together into a single word. Now, here we've got an interesting case. Izo, we haven't seen this before. Is that correct? I thought we I had seen Izo. We've got it in the sentence before. They went out again and cast it's... the jumping bonito. But the last one was caught in that school of fish. So I thought we've seen Izo, but maybe Izo is one of the ones we can't quite. Yeah, I'm looking for swirling bonito. The bonito, but maybe it's the swirling fish. Yeah. So we're a little stuck on Izo. Now we get down here. Uh, wait, wait, wait. In um, the one beginning with Ravea. Uh, scroll down a little bit in the flex. Is it all together? Oh, no, it's, it's all together in it's three contiguous sentences. Yeah. 
So we have one beginning with Maka, one sentence, then one beginning with Toka, and then Rabea. There we have Izo is the penultimate word, uh, 11.3. And it just says that school of fish. So I don't think it's necessarily could be Sorna, but I think we can just say that it's Bonito. Bonito. Could be more general, it could be fish. A uh, Hawaiian for fish is ia. That might be cognate with this. Well, um, proto-oceanic word for fish was ikan. Yeah, not a good match here. Yeah, so it's not a good match. A becoming Z is extremely rare. Well, just to explain for the listener why ikan is not a good match for Izo, uh, K becoming Z is unlikely. What I'm See, saying. For the most part, the vowels are pretty consistent. So, like ikana or igana or something. Here. We would be predicting igana, which is what it is in Roviana. So I already knew. But if it's cognate with the Roviana word for it, but I suspect that they aren't going to use a macro term for fish when it's something so. It'd be like um, if you had a sheep farm and I kept, or uh, if yeah. you had a cow farm. You would refer to it as beef a lot, not just meat. And you wouldn't oh, go so meat. Go, oh. And you'd be unlikely to say, I'm going to check on the tetrapods. Right. This is a better example. I'm going to check on the tetrapods. People are like, what? <laughs> a tetrapod means a four-legged animal. But beyond that, actually, it means anything descended from the first fish that came up on four fins, from which all land dwellers are descended and several sea dwellers. So snakes, even though they don't have fish, are still tetrapods. They're not quadrupeds, but they are tetrapods. Quadruped was the word I was looking for. Okay. Those are cognates, by the way. That makes sense. All right. So Izo is probably something about swirling fish. It might even be, I think the Umoro, Umoro is the bonito jumping. I think Izo is the species name. Don't you? Yeah, I'm... I'm... Izo might be bonito. Where the head is with Zana? We have Zana here too. Zana looks like agreement marking to me. It looks like something like that or whatever. Like it should go with the Nana there, that, something like that. Um, They had finished the school of fish. Yeah, we aren't even done with all this, but Izo, I... it leaves us stuck and we really need it by this sentence we just added. Why, really... why do you why don't you think it's Benito? What else would it be? I mean, what else would be Bonito in our sentences? Well, Bonito itself is only mentioned in the sentence that has um it, it's twice, and then in the third it's fish. They're all contiguous here, just this one episode. So eleven one, yeah, yeah. It's the first three sentences of a And you get umoro. And then down here you get bonito again, and you get umoro. But you also get izo right before that. I agree. I mean, but you know, in several sentences which does not contain the word bonito in the translation, um, but you never get umoro in a sentence which doesn't contain bonito. So I'm tempted to think that umoro is the part that, in, that actually indicates the type of fish. Okay, and maybe Izo is the school or the jump, the swarming, the jumping. Uh, something like that. And the other hint is here is the way they've actually got it with a comma. The posture. Oh, the comma. Like if it was English grammar, they'd be like um, the cows, the herd. The quadrupeds. Yeah, the quadrupeds. Something like that. So Naizo, I think, is swirling. And maybe bonito jumping is umoro, and umoro izoza umoro. It's that's why we're getting swirling bonito. So izo is like school of fish or something like that. Um, nice. We can appeal to the Roviana grammar to see if there's anything similar, but I don't recognize anything. But you know, I'm not, you know, there's tons of words. I'm gonna look for iso. Sadly, there's probably gonna be a bunch of them. Because we've seen a lot of um, correspondences. Oops. It's not of a pig. No, not here. Oh, not Iso per se. Does Roviana not use a Z? 
Is it Zless? No, it is a Z. It's just that I've noticed that a lot of times that Z okay. in Ganonga is an S in Rubiana. Uh, for example, the word za for third singular is sa in Rubiana, just as an yeah. S. Okay. So I'll check both. I think that there's both are possible. Now, Kiso is shark, I believe. Basioto a rank smell as a Basioto crocodile Kiso shark. I've never smelled a crocodile. Consider yourself lucky. I'm not getting anything good here. I yeah. think that we've I think we've passed where it would be. Yeah, yeah, that was I think the first place it took us was to the eyes. The eyes did not have it. It's just that like as I said, there's two Iana. There's two sections here. So we're back in another Oh eye. that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. So there's forgot. nothing. We can check Ezo right quick. Although I think we just saw all the eye sections and there's no, well, we don't have to go down a little bit to see. No, there's none there. And if I go way back up. We can go check the original eye section. H I J K. There's no J, so I will be right for K. It take us a second to get there. Mm -hmm. A lot of K words, of course. It's a good sound. Makes sense. Isomo kind of spout. You drink the bottle now. No, we aren't getting any uh, any free advice here. We can go ahead and look for Bonito and see what else it tells us. Yeah, let's, let's go on the story. Okay. Yep. Uh, I guess I'm willing to take a risk and say Iso is swirling or Bonito or something. Let's just put it in the word gloss and we can analyze it after more research. Okay. We can lexicalize it then. So not Iso is clearly not Iso. Or the school. I think it has to be finished. Well, ah, I hate the idea that Izo just means fish because it, the more and more I look at it, the more and more that seems like the best gloss. And then you get Avara to mean the school. Unless Avara means fish and Izo is school, which would make that sense. seems an unlikelier word order to me, but you're the expert like there. A likelier or less likely? Less likely to me. Which you'd one? Have, you'd have a head head initial compound, school of fish. To me, it seems that way. I see if it's a compound, not an adjective. Even if it was an adjective, it would be in the same order. Head initial. Ah, this pondaka. What about that? I think that's making, but I don't know. Nalai. Making, you say. Went to catch. Zai embark. Hmm. I forgot we'd done that. The fish, the bonito that were swirling. Yeah. All right. With bamboo rods, they fixed line. Oh, and fixed lines. They cast and cast and cast till they had finished that school. Turia is almost certainly Turi plus A. Wouldn't you agree? Seems very likely. Not that we have Turi. Arendi. It's going to be the finish off part, I, I suspect. 
I wonder how long it would take to catch a whole herd like that. Uh, not herd, school. School. Yeah, it's probably no no simple feat. It sounds like from the previous story or previous recording where we were reading the story, they drag like some line in the water between the two big boats, and it kind of concentrates them in, and they and they mm. just flip them out. Um, Oh, palindi means all done, we've said. To yeah, all we done. That already. Right. Let's, yeah, let's just keep going. Let's get this text all I mean, in. Let's go. Oh, nice. Let's make, oh, hold on. Make it a lowercase l. Uh, lowercase a, rather. Yeah, you could have done, yeah, you can do that in the thing there, too. That's good. One second, be right back. Let's not go. <laughs> Yeah, we'll leave it like that. That leaving Ezo is bothering me, but I don't know what to do about it now because I'm I'm not too certain what it is. Maybe it'll come to you in a dream. Like that other thing. So, or hey, one finished, but let's go out and get one more. So one school is finished. Yeah, that's right. That's the unit. Let's go out and get one more. Maria Kota Monesa. Another Revea, so that looks transitive. Why is Adia those which? And there's Adia's let's go. Whoa. <laughs> Adi, oh, that, let's go. I mean, we could have homophones, happens, happens yeah. to the best languages. This, uh... Ota. Mule is return. Let's go again. Revea. This is the only Reve we see. Only Reve we see. Got it that way now. This one we can actually do, I think. So seeing that the Ngari is part of the verb phrase. Huh? How can it not be guessing gua? There we go. It Come on. Now. Unless it's seen that specific form, it, it's not going to. Just guess it. Is that it? <laughs> okay. So, Reve, Kona, na, na, almost certainly there is a possessor. What Kona means, not that clear. Hey, one's finished. One down. I don't know that it's possessive. It could be that the verb root is konan and you get an echo vowel. Doesn't seem like a slam to me. Multiple things could be true. Gonna leave it for now. Um, cool. I uh, think kota is a future marker. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, cool. And then that ta that we've seen also. I so that. That. that wasn't my reasoning at all. Go ahead and explain your reasoning. Well, the ta, we've seen, we had it, we suspected that it means we will or let us or something with a verb. But ko is also that really common conjunction slash preposition in yeah. order such and such. Let us go in order that, again, we will embark and catch another uh, school. So, yeah, I'm not sure. One plural object, I really doubt that, but it has, it might just be a general index of irrealis or future or something. I think it's a general future word. Yeah. Uh, the Roviana general future tense is cote. So wow. That's, yeah, it's there. But it, that's not necessarily the best reasoning. It just it looks like it's in right the right spot. This is where the syntax stuff comes in. It just looks like it's in the right spot. It's got three out of four letters. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a final <laughs> vowels change for some reason. It's not clear to me. Certainly. Um, you know, Voltaire's famous statement about etymology. What did Voltaire say? I forget. The, the consonants, the vowels count for nothing and the consonants for very little. In his age, it was still in its infancy. Yeah. He, he was suspicious about, he thought the project was a bit dubious, I guess. Those that don't know. So when was Voltaire alive? No. 18th century. I think he was alive at the time of that Lisbon earthquake. So the 1700s? Mm. Yeah, so 
historical linguistics was in its infancy then, but by the end of the 1800s, say by 1900, the process was so well refined that some considered it at that time the greatest intellectual achievement of humans. 1694 to 1778. So he died just as the U.S. was becoming a thing. He couldn't stand it. Yeah. <laughs> he had to piece it I'm sure that had nothing to do with it. But yeah, um, it is a pretty interesting thing, the history of the historical method, of the comparative method in linguistics. And I may have talked about this before, but one thing that's kind of shocking to me is that it's still not solved. But the field of linguistics has, for the most part, 99.9% .9 moved on. It's very hard to learn comparative method in school. If you go to Harvard, it's going to be easy. But one thing is, it's actually very hard to get into Harvard. <laughs> Allegedly. Most people don't know it. It's not easy to get in. So, <laughs> even though you may want to learn historical method from one of the last... I know that there are... Nobody's going to listen to this. But if they did, there would be a couple professors in the US and Canada and Australia who would be shaking their fist furiously that they are out there doing comparative linguistics. But I challenge them to place one of their PhD students in a job. So who are you, Jasanoff or somebody else? Are you you're talking about Harvard now? Yeah, yeah. who are you talking about, the, the one person who's doing it? Well, I was actually thinking of some people in Australia that are this, you got this guy and that guy, or this lady and that lady, uh, as the case may be. There are a couple people out left. I specifically think of my good friend, Dr. Alex Smith, who's also Tyler's friend. And uh, he was second choice and third choice for some extremely elite jobs in the few places. Harvard and Yale both do. So it's places like that where he's been pretty close to being picked, but it feels like the, the field has largely shifted to computational approaches to historical linguistics, kind of leapfrogging, actually solving the problem. We know that the comparative method works. We know the comparative method in linguistics is more rigorous methodology than any other thing in linguistics. There is nothing as close to as rigorous as the comparative method. But once kind of linguists were like, oh, this really, really works, it's almost like then we lost interest. Not me personally and not Tyler, but the field of linguistics, there's very little jobs for it. I think because one of the problems is you have to kind of claim you know everything to get published. I know how this works. But so people like Greenberg, a, a famous historical linguist, he's called a lumper. In historical linguistics, there's lumpers and splitters. People who want to put more languages together, people who want to separate them apart. Greenberg did giant lumping with, for example, Native American, South American languages, it was way off, um, but is still largely the source of claims for popular linguistics publications. So if you read something in an online publication, not a, an academic publication, you're probably going to get told this and that thing about Native American languages being related, that nobody that works on these languages actually thinks that. That's just what Greenberg did in the 60s. And in any case, okay. long and the short of it, Let's keep let's keep inputting, by the way, as we go. There is a comparative method, but we're going to focus on what we can control now. That's right. Should we Don't... call out the future for now and then see if it's wrong in the, in the future? Yes, let's do that. Now, it's weird that with one instance of Kota, I feel so much more confident <laughs> than I do with several instances of Izo, which ah, I want. I, you know, when you got up for a second, I almost created an entry for Izo, but I just can't quite bring myself to do it. Hey, one finish. Let's go out and get more. Our next sentence says, let's look at it in gloss mode, see if we can figure out a bit of what's going on here. They went out again. Uh, my little icons in the way. Can you scroll down? Just a touch there. Thank you. Went out again and cast for the jumping Benito till the last one was caught from that school of fish. Ligu, ligu catches my eye. What a cool word. It is. Zaire embark, they, so they embark another, cast them, the Izo, jumping Benitos, Dovala, Ligu, Ligu. Okay, I'm gonna search yeah. for some items. One really neat thing we're getting here is that we're getting Izo again with Bonito but we're not getting omuru, omuru or whatever the word was. 
I think Ezo might be Bonito now. Okay, I have oh, an idea about Keith. What's that? I have an idea about the Tovala. What's Tovala? Uh, jump. It is the verb jump. She just get it two times. Let's search for it again. Control F, Tovala. Get it twice. As they went short, is... another school started jumping. So what is Sora? Sora is also something like also or two. So, so maka, maka one. One. we have two clauses there. Have they... we anything like Gangiri before? Gangiri. Because I think it means something like at that moment. Because there we have, as they went shorewards. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And unless Tovala means like at that moment jumping or whatever, then we need this temporal information. Must be somewhere in Gangiri. It is unique. Only hit for QAQ. At that moment would fit, though. And it feels kind of that way. Well, I'm going to that thread for now, but I bet if we went through Gang and Gangi and so we... I, Angi and Giri, or I mean, oh, we might find, find something. And by the time we finish this book, if we haven't found it, look, I'm just going to buy the other book and we'll enter that one too. Sure. Yeah. We'll go nuts. All right, but jumping makes sense here. Let's look at our other. It seems to be in the right place in the sentence for it to be a jumping word. All right, I'm going to call this jump. And then in the definition, I'm going to say jump as a fish. Right. Because it might not be the same, but if it's the same, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Made me cry. Lee Lee Hu. It made you cry. No, it won't. Oh. <laughs> that it doesn't hurt. Lee Lee might be the till part. Benito, the jumping ones. Naizo Zatovala, the jumping Benito. Yeah. And, and Benito, you think the Benito. The Benito that jump. Uh huh. This is, uh, is a relative clause marker, and it's homophonous with the third singular. And we've gotten za acting also like a kind of demonstrative that, which I believe is historically where it came from. Uh -huh. Not that in English we use that for too many things, so that's not that's not very helpful. That mm. can be an invariant particle for relative clause marker or a demonstrative, and in this case, the demonstrative, and it's not necessarily that in every language the demonstrative becomes conflated with the relative clause marker certainly not but here now since you've got this za third singular subject agreement although is it the case that we only getting the za in in that subject position in realis i think so the fish they jump the fish it jumps or whatever yeah I, i'm down to call iso bonito what do you think Works for me. All right, we might we might change this later. It just seems like such a good word for fish because it's so small. But so, but this is not a small fish, you said. No, it's not a small fish. I just think that like a super high word. frequency words are often a little bit smaller. That's like if you if you lived on a tropical island and ate fish pretty much every day, I think that fish would be a. Although there, I said it in Rovian, it's a three syllable word because the echo vowel. All right, I'm going to call it Bonito for now. Leave everything else not sure, because I really don't know. But it solves a couple little problems for us. Legal, legal? I think that's until. Until they cast finish them, Avara Zana. Avara Izo Zana. Avara could be school or something like this. Do we get Avara in other places? Let's check. Let us check. We get it twice, but I think. Now, about it, is it? Remember, they fix the cast and cast till they finish the school. So the last one was caught. It's it's school. Uh, it ha almost has to be With, until they finish that school of fish. Mark, Mark Abara Izuzana. In fact, reading Avara Izu so many times makes me think that Izu is actually just fish, and that we know that it's Bonito because of the context. To be <laughs> hard to tell. And Avada is school of fish. What do you think for Avada is school of fish in any case? I like it. It feels like it should be a noun with the na preceding, and then it's the head of its phrase, so it's in the right place. 
school. I'm going to play school.fish. How's that? Or you think school.of.fish or just school? No, school no. I, would just, I would just do school and then put in the lexicon that we mean school of fish. Not the escuela. Whatever. School fish works. Yeah, they probably won't have a word for school as in la escuela anyways, unless it's something like siculu from right. English. You might think that school is a universal phenomena. Uh, and if you're American, you probably think this is pretty good. But school is not a universal phenomena. And um, it's just one way to learn things and not necessarily the best. It works for us at our scale. So it's not a slam on anybody's culture if they do or do not have school. We're going to call right. it school that so right way. And I'm going to go to the entry and say, school of fish. And that is where the fish go to learn. Uh, 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 is that how you sell, spell school? Yep, just like that. So this is a case of an English measure word classifier, I suppose. Is it a classifier? It's just a, a noun for collective of animals. We get very specific in English, although they're extremely low frequency things. But a murder of crows. Herd of cows. Fish and not fish. I don't know why, but looking at school, now it looks fine. But for a second there, when I was looking at school, it's like I looked at it for the first time ever in my life. And I couldn't believe it was spelled this way. Now it looks fine again. But for a second there, I had a real liminal experience. I couldn't believe that <laughs> this was going on. I think Zana is a demonstrative like that or something. Yeah, it seems to stick two together. Um, I don't I think it's I'm going to M. For demonstrative. There we have it. Zana. Yep. So that would be something to examine in detail. All of these za and na words that we get. Try I'm going to call them both demonstrative determiner. And at some point, yep. once we'll sort them out. Through enough, enough text, what we're going to do is make kind of like a list, if you will, of things we need to investigate further. And one of them will be demonstratives and what we'll do is we'll go into our flex concordance and we'll look at all of them and we'll put all the examples together and we'll try to tease out the meanings we'll do the same thing for pronouns and other things we were thinking about doing it today but um starting it today but i feel we're so far from we've learned a lot but we're so far from being able to we what we could write about for example i think already is a bit about the agreement that we've seen and that might even help us figure out the next things we need so that might be something we would do in a future episode. Legal, legal evades us. And it's probably the only mention, I'm guessing. It is. Well, actually, no, I didn't check. But yeah, I think I'm pretty sure that it's until, just like that Ngi, no, Ngangiri was the as at that moment one. Let's just put in the word gloss so we have it. I don't think it's until. So uh, based on where it is in the sentence, it'll, Please enlighten me. I think it's exactly in the right spot. In English, it's in the right spot. But this Zana goes after. So this za tovala legal legal Zana is all one thing. And it's modifying Izo. So if I were going to do brackets, I do brackets around na and Zana. Wow. And so I don't think until would be part of the noun phrase of the preceding clause. That's why I think that. Okay. All right. That, that, I buy that. The cool also the cool is initial. Beto Palendi means un, kind of like together till the last one, till done. That That's my guessing there on how we're getting this translation into English. What legal legal means? Maybe it's the way they were jumping. They were jumping all legal legal like. I think that's a good guess. I also think it might mean bonito <laughs> and easel <laughs> right. fish. In that case, let's leave it. Oh, we got to leave it for now, yeah. Yeah. We got to leave you, leave you. Then the oh, next one is those three words. All we need is one story about fishing that's not about Bonito, and we'll know if Izo is fish or not. The more I hear about it, the more I think it has to be Izo. But in 12.3, that last word looks like roast. I don't know why it's approved, but this is the go ashore paro. Otherwise, it would be parojo if it were in isolation in 12.3. There's no roasting going on. Uh, go to the Analyze tab, please. Then we'll get a fuller... Yeah, yeah. There we go. They too short. Which, to remind you, that was the 
original meaning of our word arrive. They too shore down. They arise. Which we like to shore because it's specific. Uh, yeah. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't. Can you fix it in the word glass though? It still says roast. It's a little silly that way sometimes. Yeah, go ashore. That's why I wanted to delete the duplicated allomorph. And then we didn't do it with Veve. So. All right. And we've got this and one. Now we're down to 13. When they had reached the shore at Rinjun Bangara. Oh, I read that already. The reason for all that catching is an omen. Let's see what we're missing here. Okay. I think I see where the omen has to be. It has to be Mulongo, right? Pretty much. It, it has is to be an omen. Thing. Said all the old men, and Pamoa must be old men. Yes, that's right. That seems to have a few prepositions, a compound with a preposition embedded in it. Mulongo. Mulo. Oh, if that's true, etymologically, maybe. Maybe, I think I'm eye-lousing. So, in Roviana, the word for married man is palambatu. Now, I okay. took the batu part to mean head, like batu patu, head, rock, cliff. Yeah, I remember. So, I thought pala had some other meaning, but what if it was uh, la batu, mm -hmm. la bat, and then it just, yeah. So, I'll go with pamoa as old men. Assume nothing. This is one of our few examples where it looks like object agreement, but it's not. Uh, I'm currently working with a student who is writing programs to a computer program to recognize object agreement in Roviana, which works very similar to Gononga. And these few words, which ends in OA or something, is a huge problem for the computer program. Really? The only solution I can think of currently is to write a list of all the exceptions and have the computer skip those. That's Old dot man. I think it's gender specific. I do think so. That's why I guessed it. But it could just be old person. Like it could be old and then Ria. Yeah. Is... Now this Ria, there is nothing else in the text that could mean all, I think. Said all the old men. I think that's a possible meaning of Ria. Uh, and I think that... Uh, the two, Gengu Ni, they're saying this because the Ria Pamoa is actually still the subject, and Gengu Ni is, they said to, basically the old men, them, the old men, said it to whoever they were warning, I guess. So yeah. The reason for all that catching is an omen, said the old men. So the Choisel people, now we, Kamundi, Kamu is to come. That's right. Those from Choisel. Did we already get Tata? We've never solved Tata? Looking for Tata now. We get it four times. Make it a little bigger. As a string of letters. Cool. That's this sentence, I believe. Let's, let's oh, you know what? If I just narrow these columns, I was wanting a bit more space. Then we could fit more on a page there. In, yeah, that's good. You don't need to adjust that. Just move the cursor left a bit or click home or something. Okay, so then they said, okay, there will be not them. They're different ones. You will find well back in the hole. Vatata. Look close by. Because hmm, 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 hmm. I already have my guess on right. what it is. Do you have a Let's guess on Tata? Not yet. Let's look at the next example. I'll so see. he went to look for them and those which stayed quietly outside close by the hole. Didn't take. Not exactly. Didn't take booty yet. Didn't take them. Not Tatana. Seems to be the word hole. H-O-L-E. In that instance. Let's see some more. Tatava. Who? I think that's just a, a word of similar structure. Yeah. So let's go back up to these two in the first story. We have to go over to va va With that va, va looks like a causative prefix. 
Okay, we're in paragraph, universal paragraph three and four. So I'll scroll down to three and four. Yeah. For right this three, where three and four touch, I guess. Three. Lost, so we can see okay. it. <laughs> I lost all that progress. Remember to click a, remember select a specific word whenever you toggle over. We've got this there. one. And they said the crab holes look close by. My tata's on it. Yeah, we did not get tata. I'm betting this na is a typo for na. Yeah, I think so. We've already got bongo as crab hole, so. Okay, so it's not the. I think this one will make it easier. I definitely know what this word means by now, by the way. I have extreme help because it's is a, it a, verb, a verb of motion. Negative. Then they said, where there are crab holes, look close by. The crab will be there. Not them. There are different ones you'll find well back in the hole. We don't know Gomboro yet. It exists by... Oh, this one is hard because we don't know these two words. But we know this is natatanana, but. So he said, but not them. Mm -hmm. But he didn't capture them or, or don't capture them. Is it he didn't or don't? Because they're telling him what to do. Yeah, Zake is, I think, misglossed there a little bit. It is the same pieces, but it's not a perfective. Utterance. It's three singular neg, basically, yeah. right? Zakitegoria. Maybe even realis. I don't know. Or maybe even irrealis. Not that clear now. This one's realis. This context is, yeah. Where there are crabs. Look close by. That's batiria. Nana azaria. Ge, probably for nge. Kole will be there. You say lao batiria is look close by. But which part means close? Maybe because you're going, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't see a part that makes look In this sentence, we also get look close by. Look close by. Scroll up so I can see the top line. There we go. That place where the, you will. Where it exists, it will exist. So we got this, where there are crab holes. Future should be changed to irrealis, but whatever. Okay. Vatatazana. Look close by. Okay, so you think it means close? Do you think tata means look? No, I don't. No, it means close, and vatata means cause close. Okay. I propose to you. Now, we go back to our other story where we were. 13. Yeah, yeah. They're coming, they're close. So close they are coming, those from from Choisel. Kopala. So the Choisel people are coming and will kill us. So they're coming closeness them, the people from Rauru. Wow, so something you know they will kill you. They you will kill how you something like this. I believe Tata means close is my point. Seems good. And somehow this sentence uh, is what convinced it for me. Oh, tatava already means fly. That relative look to okay, to me, never mind. I had thought about that when we saw relative close, thick, that the close might be part of the compound there. All right, and we still have some kamundi yeah. we can solve yeah. easily. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it knows the analysis. It just doesn't know a word loss. It's not good at coming up with those. I'm going to call their coming. Okay. Think? Those from, yeah, yeah, sounds good. Those from Joizel. Wow. This K could be something else. Kupala Palazara. Coming and will kill us all. Now, Muna is troublesome. There's no second singular, or there's a second person subject there. You think there could be any 
connection between the words. Okay, you will die. What's you will that? Die. You will die by them, it could be. But why isn't it we? What were you saying? Is there any connection between? Pala and Pamoa. Ah, uh, yes. Since I just told you this Palambatu thing. Palambatu, yeah. I'm not like Pala. I'm like, oh, wow, there's no Batu. What if it's Pa Moa, Pa La? And Pa is something like masculine, and Moa is old man, and La is like warrior age. Oh, wow. Cool. Probably, uh, probably these are obscure now, but there was probably some ancient compound that put these words together. So I'm guessing Pala is... Because you have so the Choisel people, and it's just them from Royal. Blah, them from Bowdo. Oh, yeah. So, but I, I, I'm, I'm willing to... Let's search for Pala. You have all three stories in here now, right? Yep. So we may get something we don't know. Then we get Pala once, which we already knew. So be it. You will be killed when you go look for a land crab at Petu Petu. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I guess maybe there's multiple Petu Petus, but I, I know where Petu Petu is. Uh, Pala. Mm. Ow, Pala. Ow. There it's connected with killing, just like in this instance. You will be killed, and here we have they were the people are coming and will kill us all. This Pala could be all also. Completeness hey, of Al we think is second person singular, right? Pronoun. I I agree. Yeah. So you will be killed when you go looking at a land crab. Maybe it could be when as well. So when the Valo people come, you will be killed. That's how you'll be killed. I, I'm a little bit too torn on this one to make a commitment. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I mean, I can not see that you are torn, but I see the reason for being torn. I'm also <laughs> torn. Let's I put in that. more uh, four sentence glasses, though, free translations. That is the way they saw the reason for catching all the bonito. So when the choice of people got there, they would kill all the all of the Maluku. This one got as correctly. As fantastic. Kale. Kale. Now you notice um Huh, that is the way. Okay. This Zagwa is like it is how rather than he said it. Don't we have two of these? <laughs> I think I'm gonna leave it like this for now because I don't really let's go to let's go to analyze and see if we what else we put in. Hey, that doesn't change. Yeah, that's just for the word was. It knows that in any and situation. I don't know what Kale means. We have three instances of it. Uh you know what it is? It's the word it's a dictic for a place there. Or there or that, maybe. On the Vena, it looks. How do you know that? That is the way they saw the reason. Uh, go to the next hit there. Then, hey, don't, don't strike there. It is I. Kate, there we have just the bare negative. Kate, the body manja. Manja is the cudgeling one. Weapon and verb. Kale araguani. There. Me. Guani. Guani could be I tell you or something. Do you see anything else that Kale could be in that instance? There is very compelling for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not there, the dummy subject. It literally means yeah, yeah. something is there. So how do you want to call it? Well, gloss it is there, right? Then or there. Yeah, let's say there. We've already got another Nana there, but that's different. Nana there is almost like that. Just leave it as there for now and untangle it later. Sounds good. Okay. There he said, that is the way they saw the reason. So, quotative Zawa, is, it makes sense there. They're interpreting the omen. The reason, catching up. The Benito, they, yeah, here, the Izo for the fish. Looks pretty good. 
So when the choice will be done. All right. That is what they saw as an omen and catching all that Benito. And that is the story of the Maluku. Did we never and put an omen? No, we didn't. Let's do it now and it'll yeah, it'll fill in. Either either place, wherever you teach it that word. I was just uh making sure there weren't two spellings or something. I can't believe we didn't put it in already. And that is, uh, and why in all of the forests of the Maluku on the hills, you will see flat places and stone altars. Patu, you get again. Indi Patu. Indi is going to be altar, I guess. And that figures in the third story, I believe. Betoni. Beto. <laughs> I wish I wish the that flex made that popping sound when you do that action. So satisfying. How should we put the word gloss for this? Finished? Uh we finish. Catching all that. Ah, there it's for the completeness of the catching, I think. Yeah. Catching to end, catching all, maybe. It's kind of like completely. Completely. Yeah. But I think finish works since it's consistent with the other ones. I'm gonna leave it as all right. I was more worried about how knee should change the interpretation then. I don't know. I don't know. Arambelama. Arambelama. Hmm. Flat places, I think. Ndoru, what will that be? Forest. Now we have forest, Toku Toku. That is the. And why? That is why in all of the forests, Ndoru could be all. On the hills, you will see flat places and stone altars. I feel so confident that it's all. You know, a cognate, you know, a sister word. Yeah. Cool. The Roviana word is Donduru. I believe. Let's double check that spelling. Now we get it. So we'll. Complains about everything. All, every, the whole. Now we're getting Dodu means this do here was deleted. Because it's not reduplication. Okay. It's a Dondur or something. Mm -hmm. the, the middle and the D's and R's and stuff are similar, and well, you can see why they might simplify that. It's pretty cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. All the forest of Maluku, forest of the Maluku. Indy the hills. Yeah, I think so. Altar. I'm putting down as one altar. A A R, please. Not the verb change, but A L T A R. Very good. Tyler's quick with that stuff. That's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> Flat place. If only this information was actually valuable, you would make big bucks, Tyler. I do okay. Ah, uh, it comes again in the next sentence. They're translated as level places. So Adam Balama, we'll call it flat place. How about that? Yeah. Flat dot place. I'm only choosing flat over level because uh, it's shorter. That's it. And let's look at our gloss again. Uh, yeah. This second story is shaping up. Yes. Now, I'm a little confused. Do you get the logical sequence there? Why are, what do the flat, what do the flat places and stone altars have to do with the catching of the bonito and the omen? Okay. Does so, that make sense? let's first talk about the flat places and the stone altars. So, this is really about ancient villages or peoples or societies that existed and went extinct, and it's a cautionary tale. But it's also an explanatory situation where mm -hmm. if you go to Tetapare right now, so Tetapari is an island in the uh, New Georgia well, archipelago. Can you show us? Uh, I can try. Are we going to be allowed to look at Google? Is that 
<laughs> I don't see why not. All right, I'm looking at it. I think for educational purposes, Google doesn't care. This is purely educational. Let's go ahead and get us a uh, revealing my location. <laughs> I doxed you something. Okay, here's Solomon Islands. So we haven't talked about this very much. There's Hawaii, there's Australia. Here's Solomon's right there. We're going west. This is the Western Province. This is the New Georgia Archipelago. This is the island of Tetapare. Right, this island is uninhabited, but it was inhabited. Maybe 150 years ago or something, it was inhabited. It's now one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. I know a bunch of biologists go there because people haven't been there, living there in the last 100 years. There's been a lot of basically ecological preservation on accident. It's not that the people in this area are destroying the environment uh, per se. It's their interactions with outsiders that destroy the environment. And Tetapare, I'm sure people have done a illegal logging there. But there's a big movement in Solomon Islands to protect against the illegal logging. The city. That's interesting. Because you're not allowed to just, you, like, if you want to, you can't just visit. You need special permissions and stuff. That's my understanding. But if you go there, one of the things you're going to see is like stone stackings and things like this, because they, after whatever thousands of years of headhunting, places around here stopped having beachfront villages and they started literally building walls out of stones okay. against it. Now this is Rananga right here. Ah, uh, perfect. Good to know. Um, I don't know if it's going to tell us which, it probably won't give us much information on villages. So that won't be very helpful to us. But you get flat places and stone stuff where people used to exist, but they've been wiped out. So that's that part. What okay. it has to do with the Bonito. Okay. So uh, this is something I don't know as well. Right. But what they're saying is all the old men knew that whatever they were doing was taboo. It was against the rules. You're not supposed to do it. It's a bad omen. And um, that part would have been, it would have been part of this story, which is culturally obvious to all the listeners. It's just not obvious to us. Now I can ask people, but one of the problems is even things that were culturally obvious to Americans a hundred years ago. Now this story isn't a hundred years old. It's 40, 50 years old, something like that. It's telling of um, it. But it's a retelling. That's correct. It's always a retelling. And it may not even be as obvious to people today. Now, if you find the original storytellers, but the person who told this story looked like he was middle-aged 40 years ago. So he might not be there to tell you. I know that uh, the Roviana storyteller, Pinge, who told me three stories, she told me other things uh, with the help of a translator, because I don't speak Roviana that well. And she's monolingual. She only speaks Roviana. She told me other things about customs and traditions that other people didn't know, either because they forgot or they didn't have the right ex it's like for example i my parents were dairy farmers and i know things about farm animals and stuff that a lot of people don't know but like my grandmother knew how to like which plants you could collect my grandmother knew how to get maple syrup in the way all sorts of in I, I have like one percent of her knowledge it's just one percent of knowledge most modern americans have no access to mm -hmm. but a lot of the modern uh people in solomon islands the 1% of knowledge is is what uh, that I have is similar to what a lot of them. And now, of course, many of them have much more knowledge than me. And you can go to Solomon's and still find people that more or less live in the old ways and have all the knowledge. But it's not easy to find them. And as my main interaction with people from Solomon Islands is over the internet, I've selected for people that are more familiar with the internet, people that can read and write in English very well, people that are interested in theoretical linguistics. And because of all these things... I can't say exactly what the connection is between what their taboo was. Let's read up in the story a little bit. Okay. Another thing was when the Bino jumping range of making the water swirl, they swirl and start swirling the bonito with the bamboo rep, blah, 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 and they finished. Let's go to shore, they said. As they went to shore, another school started jumping. Hey, one finished, but let's go out and get more. They went out again. The reason for all that catching is an omen. All right, so... Um, I think that either it means that that there was another school jumping was an omen that bad things were coming, 
or because they were too greedy and got too many fish and didn't leave enough. For example, I know that there are many things in Roviana that you can only eat in certain types of year. For example, there's this type of uh, crab called garumu, and it's a big one, and they're around. I remember getting up in the night, the first night I was in a village, and kind of like tripping over crabs and being pretty freaked out. They were everywhere. The crabs and these giant toads. Anyways, um, you can only eat the crabs at like one time of year for like a couple weeks or something, and that's it. They just exist the rest of the year and you do not eat them. And these practices are extremely common throughout the Pacific. And I've read about them in Australia and stuff as well. So I bet there's some restriction on oh. either how much they should collect or straight up. It's, you know, people are reading the future and saying, oh, we only get the double jump if something bad's about to happen. So it, this is kind of the information I'd love to follow up more. That makes a lot of sense. OK, thank you for uh, explaining about that. My best guess. So I think that we're almost out of time today. Uh, yeah, we did pretty good at introducing some of the new bracketing stuff, uh, going down a few paths, solving a few more words. As we go forward, the words will either be so much easier to solve or so much harder. <laughs> the, the medium hanging fruit is pretty much all sewed up. Speaking of, you know that once we get this one in, let's go back over the first text again before we go to the third, because there were still a lot of gaps there. I agree. I think it'd be a great time. We just solved one today with Tata. So, and we may have solved other ones and not realize that they've been automatically filled in. All right. But with that, I'm going to end today's session and we'll record another one. Uh, and I hope everybody stays tuned till we learn more about Gananga. Ciao. See you.